In December 1915, Mina Miller Edison, the inventor's wife, pulled a cord that revealed a grand statue of a fully armored person standing victoriously astride a gallant horse and holding a sword high above. Thousands of New Yorkers and dignitaries attended. In 2019, the statue site, surrounded by century-old trees, is so familiar, most Upper West Siders pass it without looking. Today on Bar Crawl Radio, we'll be talking about Jean Le Pousselle, and Anne Vaughan Hyatt, the woman who designed the magnificent Joan of Arc statue on West 93rd Street in Riverside Park, the first New York City public statue created by a woman and the first to honor a real woman. For a long time, we have wanted to talk about the Joan d'Arc statue, which is a block and a half from where we raised our family on West End Avenue. It sits right in the middle of its own island, separating Riverside Park from the elegant apartment buildings a unique spot on the Upper West Side. And so, here we go. Okay, there we go. That's Wade Ripka. <laughs> You're playing less and less of, of that. The, uh, I well, like I can, that I'll, I'll play more if you want I me to like play more. Song. I can edit it. Of the Eastern Blockheads, thank you again, uh, Wade, for letting us use that, that music. With us today are two art historians. Anne Higonet is a professor at Barnard College. She earned her PhD at Yale and specializes in history of art of, since the 17th century and the history of the history of art. That's cool. Yeah, okay, history of the history of art. Right. Her work has been supported by Getty, Guggenheim, and Social Science Research Council Fellowships as well as by grants from the Mellon, Howard, and Kress Foundations. She's a prize-winning teacher and lectures widely, including in the live arts program of the Met Museum. Michelle Bogart teaches art history at Stony Brook University. She's been featured as an art expert on several documentaries and has been widely quoted in the New York Times, New York Post, Wall Street Journal, and Harper's. From 1999 through 2003, she was the Vice President of the Art Commission of the City of New York and presently serves on that organization's Conservation Advisory Group. She has written much on large art in the New York City urban landscape, including most recently, Sculpture in Gotham, Art and Urban Renewal in New York, published last year. And with us is James Pinero, an American writer, editor, and cultural critic as the executive editor of the new Criterion, he writes on art and culture. He's a contributor to the Wall Street Journal, City Journal, New York Magazine, and the New York Times Book Review. Mr. Pinero lectures on art, politics, the art market, and cultural policy. He's been a guest on All Things Considered, The Takeaway, The Brian Lair Show, and Fox's Tucker Carlson Tonight. And if you want to learn more about Mr. Pinero, and there is more to learn, I refer you to his website, jamespinero.com. That's J A M E S P A N E R O dot com. Right. Just, just for how me, it sounds. Because you know, I wouldn't know how to spell things. Panero. Panero. Uh, yeah, okay, so whatever. James Panero. <laughs> Welcome t all to Bar Crawl Radio. It took a while for us to kind of gather this group. Um, I've got to uh, thank um, Phyllis Cohen of the Municipal Art Society for helping uh, cast um, all of you uh, so that we That's could talk Alan today about cast. the. Um, the Joan of Arc statue on West 93rd Street. And well, what's everybody drinking? I'm having, what is it? So James and I are having the KCBC and Three's Brewery, two different breweries that came together to make Purgatorio. That, that's it, what it's a Pilsner. It's a Pilsner. Pilsner right. It's a light yeah. beer. Yeah. Right. No, not the kind of beer I like. It, it's kind of, it doesn't hit you in the mouth like an IPA. I, yeah. I'm drinking Sloop Super Soft. Very judgmental. Sloop Super Soft. It, uh, it has teddy bears on the can. I don't know, I don't know why. Uh, because it's super soft. It comes soft. from Hopewell, New York, which is near Beacon, New York. And uh, the group there, they help clean up the Hudson. Maybe that's why they're called oh, Sloop. Oh, that's nice. No, well, Sloop is a boat. It's a boat, right. So they use a boat to clean right. up that, yeah. Right. So, Michelle, you're, you're... I'm drinking artisanal no-name seltzer. Oh. There you go. Okay, that's safe. But it's artisanal. <laughs> And yeah, I'm and drinking, and, yeah, yeah I, I've got pink tinted seltzer just to be a teeny Why bit colorful. Why is it colorful. pink? I 
think it's cranberry, but really it's just for the principle of having some color in it. I like okay. it. it. It's for like optics. It. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so we know, can, it contrasts yeah, we can with see, my lime. We can see it. It's a yes. little pink. Yeah. Very nice. Just How do you order that? What do you call that? Pink right there. Do you ask for pink soda? I, I, I've, I've learned it. Seltzer with a little bit of cranberry. Mm. Oh, okay. All okay. right, a very little bit. A very little bit, and the lime just comes along with it. It sounds, sounds refreshing. Good. It sounds very refreshing. I, think like I might real, have that next time. A real summery drink. So let's begin. All right. Let's begin with this historical person, person Jeanne d'Arc. Who was she? Well, she was a total nobody who came out of what in America we call left field. Uh-huh. Uh, things were catastrophic for France in the beginning of the 1400s. It was almost nothing left of the country. And it looked like it might just become an annex of England. And then this girl came along and said, I've had a vision. I'm going to help the king. I'm going to solve this problem. And she did. And the English were so angry that eventually they burned her at the stake. That's the broad stroke of, of Joan. Um, and I know a lot of people do know it, but um, there's a lot of interesting stories about Joan of Arc. She was very young when she was doing this. Um, Basically a kid. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and she died. She was burnt when she was, what, 19? 19. How long did she, how old was she when she started? Well, she said she had her first vision when she was 13. 13. But there had been, uh, there had been rumors, there were prophecies that someone would come and save France and that it would be a virgin, a, a pure young woman. So you sort of have to wonder whether Joan took that as a kind of historical suggestion and became the savior that might it had have been, been rumored. Might it have been suggested to her? Well, she felt it was suggested to her by God. And since the king was supposed to be king by divine right, it was important that the word come from on high. Mm. But you, she, she showed up at his court, and she said, I'll lead your armies to victory. And the English had been winning, 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 winning. And all of a sudden, Joan put on full battle armor, and she led the French to a stunning reversal of of fortune, and as you know, there is still a French nation, so it's, it, she prevailed. It's still there so far. I, I'm, I'm always kind of amazed at this story because uh, one of the facts we know is that she was a peasant girl. She grew up on a small farm. Uh, the Arc family, the Arc family, was uh, were peasants. Uh, they were workers of the field, um, and and yet she was able to get a meeting with Louis the Seventh um, and Charles. T- uh, Ch- I mean Charles the Seventh. Uh, and was able to um, to talk to him and talk him into this. I mean, if I tried to get a meeting with Donald Trump, I couldn't get that far, no. right? Even if I was a small peasant girl. You might try <laughs> to get you out of the country. Well, so I, I have a question, Andy. James, I mean, yeah. we, we know Joan of Arc mainly through the artwork of Joan of Arc or the, um, the, the Shaw play or the Mark Twain book about her. How much is do we have actually of her historical record versus the mythology around Joan? Well, not as much as you'd think, but there are accounts of people at court. For instance, when she makes it into court, uh, and uh, people were stunned that, uh, for example, she was able to pick out the king from among a group of people. She did seem to have some kind of privileged information, but... Really sadly, the, the most information we have about her is the accounts of her trial, which was a, a furious sort of a PR job on the part of the English to try to explain how this girl could have reversed their military fortune. So they tried every down and dirty trick in the Catholic book. And it backfired. Uh, well, backfire is a scary word in the <laughs> context. Use that term. <gasps> oh dear! Yeah, because um, a lot of the evidence that was brought against her was that she wore men's clothing, and what we need to remember is that she wasn't only wearing men's clothing in uh, in civilian life. What was really scary and brings us to the the monument we're going to talk about is that the most masculine kind of clothing of all was battle armor. Sure. 
and Joan had worn full battle armor as she as she fought and that was almost too horrible to even mention and on the basis of that she got convicted of heresy and of being a witch and in those days you know what Monty Python said you know, like burn the witch burn the witch yeah. uh, in uh, in uh, what was the name of that movie uh, uh, I don't know uh, I, I know it. I can see it. The Search for the <laughs> Holy Grail. Brian? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, um, right, right. We, no, we, we're going we're gonna to get to the question of uh, Joan um, and her dress and how that can be related to today's um, views on, on, on women. Um, I'm, I'm also amazed that here you have a not, she wasn't a large woman. Um, she, she was strong, but she wasn't kind of brutally strong, and yet she led this army. Um, is there any information out there about uh, you know, why men followed her? Soldiers, you know, rough men who killed other men. Is, is there any idea of how she was able to do that? Well, it was desperate times. I mean, the French really had gotten to a point where they had almost nothing to lose. And you know in football there's the expression, the Hail Mary pass. So she was the Hail Mary. I mean, to sort of mix saintly metaphors here, she was like the Hail Joan of French politics. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking the Hundred Years' War here, so this has been going on a long time And this already. was towards the yeah. end of that yeah. of Yes, that, uh, right, right. Years. Yeah, yeah. So like the, the French had been ground down for about a hundred years. So would you credit her for turning the tide of the Hundred Years' absolutely. War? Absolutely, wow. absolutely. I, I would say that ever since, ever since the era of of Joan herself. There's been a, a miraculous aura around what she accomplished. And for a variety of reasons, the French have really believed ever since that she really did do it. So you feel like she didn't do it? Or maybe she didn't do it? Maybe it was something oh. else? Well, there's nothing else that explains it. Okay. All right. All right. All right, so she falls off her horse. She's captured by a faction supporting the English, handed over to the pro-English bishop, Pierre Couchon, and then there is this infamous trial. Do you feel that the depictions of the trial in plays and film were an accurate description of what happened? They, des they describe how every era has felt the drama of Joan. Each one is a really stunning revelation of an intersection between what Joan was and what a different era needs to believe. Yeah, and that, that kind of gets to my question that I was going to uh, throw in, is that our, our imagination keeps going back to this uh, historical person and considering her, um, her battle successes and her ultimate sacrifice, um, and it survived the centuries. And I just wonder, is, is there anything essential about Joan d'Arc that continues to resonate within our imaginations? I mean going way back, it kind of keeps coming up again and again and again. We well, still think about it. The power of belief. All right. I would think, too, that the, 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 just the story itself of a young girl leading an army to yeah, it's victory. A good, it's a good story. Yeah. I think there are, of course, so many martyrs, so many saints, but there's something very modern about her story, how she kind of just went against her time. I mean, she kind of comes out of the blue the way she does, and she's still unexplained today. We still don't know what she's all about, really. It's a mystery. She, she remains miraculous. Right. I mean, right. all the more so because, as you say, she was small, she was a woman, she was not noble at a time when nobility was like a different species of human being from ordinary people. And I, 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 my mind keeps going back. I'm not particularly uh, religious, you know, um, but it, and it doesn't quite make sense, but part of it goes like, yeah, she was blessed. She was actually, you know, had the ear of God. Um, and that must be part of it, too. Um, well, I guess the people that were following her believed that anyway. And I guess that's know? the important thing. Right. That, I right, think she right. believed it. Right. She believed it more than anyone else. Right. And, and that radiated a sense of divine certitude. Right, mm -hmm. right. We can see how, you know, people who believe in themselves and radiate that certainty, uh, how that plays out. <laughs> In a variety of ways. In a variety of ways with a lot of different historical so that figures. That was Michelle. Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily religious Joining figures. the conversation here. Right, right. So, okay, so this is, I'm very curious about this, though. In 1914, a group of New Yorkers wanted to erect a statue to her. 1909, in fact. When they started. Okay, okay. And a committee was formed by Sanford Saltus. 
uh, and uh, and George uh, Frederick Kunz. Okay, all right. So why was there interest, so much interest in her at that time? And why not um, some American hero? And this why, is the time uh, why we were just French... getting into World War One. Yes, right. Yeah. right. Just in, it was what was erected in 1915, right? So that was right. Yeah. So if you want to know the the background for how it happens, sure, the statue sure, sure. happens here. Uh, so in 1909, there's this group of of people in New York, uh, especially this this guy uh, J. Salt and Saltus, uh, who was a um, newsmatis, newsmatis, newsmaticist, a coin guy, coin, a coin oh, okay. guy. Like yes, coins. thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, this uh, this other guy uh, Kunst, both art collectors. And they uh, they wanted to commemorate the uh, the anniversary of of Joan of Arc, the 500th 500th anniversary of Joan of Arc. So they they along with a whole other bunch of uh, francophiles uh, and supporters got together this this committee and. Uh, it took a while because that's what happens with monuments in New York. But uh, they they raised the money for the monument, and uh, most of that money came from J. Salt and Saltus uh, and and Kunz. Uh, so but he they clearly, got, he clearly was more than just a coin collector. He he had some money. He he did have some money. Um, he had he came from a. a I believe his father may have been the vice vice president at Tiffany, yeah. uh, so he had money, uh, as as did most of the people involved. And they they had a committee of people who were on the board of a museum of French art of the Institut de France, um, and so they had a kind of group of heavyweights along with other ordinary New Yorkers, and they raised this money. Uh, and the thing was, though, it was at a time when lots of different groups were trying to put monuments up in New York City. So oh. it was not foreordained that a monument to Joan of Arc was going to, to happen, and certainly not happen where, you know, at Riverside Drive and 93rd Street. So there was some competition on getting these monuments There's up. There's a lot of competition in general going the, on at that time. For the money or just... Um, for space. Ah, uh, and ah. And also for approval of monuments. So... You have uh, uh, subjects uh, that were foreign-born. Actually, m many of the subjects of mo the monuments were were not American, and that actually did become an issue with Joan of Arc when uh, when they go to the city and try to get approval. But you you know, from the time that Central Park was completed, there uh, were foreigners commemorated: uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, Heinrich Heine. Giovanni Mazzini, Simon Bolivar, and, and on and on. Um, so that was an issue, though, that the fact that she was a foreign-born uh, person. Yes, it came person. up, and it came up. Uh, it's not clear exactly who, who had an objection, but the Parks Commissioner at the time made reference to the fact that um, uh, they said... Um, some said she belonged to a too far away and distant age and that too much concerning her was visionary and legendary and that she had no vital message to give to our historical background in this country and our present day problems. Uh, so what about the fact that she was a woman? Well, I think that was a code because Joan of Arc actually uh. had been adopted as a symbol by the suffrage movement. And so she was actually way too topical for New York City. I think that's what he was I secretly see. saying. Yeah, yeah, Without yeah. actually saying that, yeah. Yeah, it was like, okay, let's... Like, so what were the people in of support that. of her saying? Well, I actually don't know that it was... It, it could have also been suffrage. I mean, that hadn't occurred to me. But I don't think that was the only thing that was going on because seen from a, a broader municipal perspective... Uh, there were there were people who were concerned about the numbers of different monuments to 
foreigners and to Jews and mm. ah. uh, mm. all different kinds of people. But given, uh, given the timing uh, around World War One, it must have also been Franco-American friendship, right? Or? Yeah, and, and a sense also of fighting against a really dastardly enemy. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, obviously, England was no longer the dastardly enemy, but... We substituted something else. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the thing was that um, the, the initial impetus for the monument happened long before World War I happened, but then the monument took on additional resonance mm -hmm. insofar it was, as it was dedicated during World War I. And, um, and again, the one of the parks commissioners, because there were sort of two that were involved, and the, the reason I keep bringing them up is they're the ones that had to approve it. They had to approve the location. Uh, and, and, they, and they still do, I assume. Uh, well, the parks department does have to still approve, yes. Uh, and then, as now, it, the monument also had to go through uh, a, a separate review process through... Um, what was then called the Art Commission of the City of New York. That didn't seem to be a problem, but it get the initial uh, the initial approval uh, was was the Parks Commissioner, and those were the guys who were concerned about the you know they're being hit with one monument after the next. You know, we want our monument here, we want our monument okay, there. Okay, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, and so uh, I think in fact the fact that the group that was sponsoring it were these upstanding New Yorkers with all these strong French connections and the Parks Commissioner was an ardent Francophile who went to live in France after the war, okay. uh, Cabot Ward. So there are a variety of... And, and how much was her canonization? She was canonized in 1920, I believe. How much was that going already at that time? Well, she'd been beatified, so mm. you're right. The sculpture comes in the sweet spot between beatification and canonization. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yes. so, so, I mean, just this whole story, it seems a lot deeper than we might first think of it. This was not a done deal. Absolutely not. In getting no. this statue Absolutely up. Absolutely not. It could have not been done. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. There, is no, there is no monument in New York City that exists... Uh, that was a done deal. As a done deal. Yeah. Every single work has some story behind it, and uh, the fact that anything gets put into place is, is remarkable. Okay. You know, I think right. that um, what's interesting about this story, too, is that it's about two women, two powerful women. The sculptor was a woman, Anne Vaughn Hyatt, and many felt she was incapable of carrying out this ambitious man-sized project. Who was Anne Hyatt? Well... Her, her full name was Anna von Hyatt, right. and it's confusing because later she became known as Anna von Hyatt Huntington. She came from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her father knew a lot about animals. She translated that into sculpting them. But like Joan of Arc, well, not quite as much, but she just came out of nowhere. She was a woman with no official academic education. She decided in 1902 she was going to make it in New York for the reasons that pe people still come to New York to make it. As a sculptor. At, as, a, as a sculptor. And um, there was a lot of need for sculptors, I guess it sounds like. It was a golden age of New York sculpture. It was a golden age of New York City civic self-ornamentation, urban, urban beautification. Right. She hid behind making animals. Went to France for a while because that was Why the center. Why behind? Why hid behind? Uh, because animals were considered a kind of minor type of sculptural subject, and she didn't want to seem to be too ambitious because that would have been bad for a woman. So she did, so at did first, you? very small animal sculptures. In New York? She did animals in New York City? Yes. Uh, she worked at the Bronx Zoo. She sold uh, animal sculptures to the Brooklyn Museum, placed a couple at the Metropolitan Museum. There was a fabulous sculpture curator then, who was himself a, a great sculptor, uh, Ch Daniel Chester French, and he gave a lot of young people a break, including her. But she knew that to make it, she had to go to Paris. Oh. So she went off there, and and... 
did the most daring thing she could possibly have done. She submitted a life-size Joan of Arc equestrian sculpture in 1910. So she did the ultimate French thing in the face of the French Academy. And that's where the rumors began that, well, she couldn't have done it because it was, it was just so big. There was so much stuff she had had to move around and, and, and she, sculpt. she knew that that was the judgment that was going to come down on her. And I heard she tried to assuage that by locking herself into a yeah. place to do the work. Yeah, she did a brilliant sort of advanced strategy by by very ostentatiously locking herself into the studio so that later, when people said she hadn't made the sculpture herself, she'd be able to say, ah, I was locked up the whole time. And so she, she had this magnificent, uh, larger-than-life than equestrian thing ready and waiting when the big break that Michelle describes happened. Right. right, so the timeline is that she was doing this independently of the commission. The commission for New York came after she created this sculpture. Right, Saltis yeah. saw, the, saw the work in the, in, it was in the Salon, right? Right, in 1910, exactly. and mm-hmm. he saw that. Uh, and on that basis, he ultimately decided that he wanted, he wanted her. Uh, That's amazing. That's a great story. It's totally amazing because she was a nobody woman. Right. But in a way, she was like the sculpture version of Joan of Arc, so it made sense. And, and, I, it, and I, I will say also to, to Anne's point about the animal sculptures, I, I think that's one reason the Joan of Arc sculpture stands out so much is because her rendering of that horse, which is a, a real horse, it's a workhorse, it's a tough horse, is remarkable. And she often did, this is a very early in her career, she then did equestrian sculptures after this, and so she's most well known for the El Cid sculpture at the um, up at Audubon Terrace and the Jose Marti sculpture right on oh, Central Park okay. South. All right. Yeah, that so, horse is not a retiring little teeny weeny right. pony. No, no. So the, no, and no, Brooklyn, the yeah. Brooklyn Daily Eagle uh, at the at the December 6th ceremony where they broke ground, uh, well, they broke ground actually in October for the December 6th ceremony. And the Brooklyn Daily Eagle said, uh, and I quote, a distinction of this statue is that it is the first equestrian statue of the maid by a maid. All the other equestrians of Joan of Arc are by men. Hyatt shows that a woman can express with fidelity the vigor and action of animal life. And then they pointed out that um, her father was this professor. You know, they had to kind of give her the ground of her father. Her father's a professor of natural Mm -hmm. history at Harvard. uh, And that at any rate, Hyatt, quote, seems to have an unusual power over animals and is related, and it is related of her that certain wild animals in the zoo will pose quietly only for her. <laughs> oh, wow. So she That's had great. a special oh, she was a powers. horse whisperer. Oh, wow. Yeah. She, she was a jaguar whisperer. A jag- oh, go. okay. I, so I, wait, Ellen, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to bring up something. She um, made the sculpture of, of um, Jean d'Arc first nude showing all her musculature, and then she put the, the armor, armor on it. it. That's a rumor, but we, we'll we don't never know, know because... I saw a picture of it, and Phyllis Cohen is with us. She supplied a picture of someone on a horse. Yeah. It was her niece. Oh, it was her niece. And it was her ah. niece. Uh, I, I'll, I'll show you. But that you. doesn't I, I prove have, that she the then picture. just... The picture came from um, Huntington's secretary. Uh, Phyllis Cohen is uh, off to the side. She didn't want a microphone. <laughs> and she tells us that um, this picture of a, um, of a nude woman on a horse, it's a sculpture, a small sculpture, was actually was supplied Anne by... Uh, was well, that would, have been, that would have been commonplace for a sculptor working uh, you know, first at different, different stages of the process, that they start with the nude figure... Uh, and then they put the clothes on oh, them really? later. That's oh, really? Yeah, that's normal. Always. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't think I, you would have gotten a new Joan of Arc as no. a product. No, 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 I know that. I know that, but I didn't know that that was a well, Yeah, because it gives you the, it, it gives a sculptor, sculptor the armature for then uh, that, getting the body parts and the, and the placement and, and, and the lighting and everything else that comes into play with a piece of outdoor sculpture, getting all that correctly. Correct. And, and my understanding of, of armor, too, is that it really is made for that person specifically, so it well, fits. Mm, no, mm. not really? Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the, 
the niece may have posed in an intermediate phase, but we have to remember that there was this 1910 version that was shown in Paris, which was photographed. And that actually is important connected to the armor because Anna von Hyatt had to have a lot of protective cover to get away with doing what she did. And so there was a story that, that was circulated about how the armor was designed by the very, very high profile Met Armor curator, Bashford Dean. For and the statue. For the statue. Mm -hmm. And she let that story go because it suited her purposes. But what the photographs of the 1910 sculpture show is that she had completely designed the sculpture before she ever came back to New York and Bashford Dean was ever contacted. Okay. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, I, I, I think this is a good segue here into talking about the design of the statue itself. Now, what, what, what it looks like. Uh, Upper West Siders, head over to the Riverside Drive, West 93rd Street. You can see exactly what we're talking about. But for those uh, listeners on Barcore Radio uh, who are not here in New York, can we, can we do some kind of description of the statue? And I just wanted to do it this way. Can we go to each one of you and tell us, when you think of this statue, where does your mind go? What do you see that is a feature that kind of like jumps out at you? Well, we've got a lover of the horse over here. Okay. okay. Let's start with James. Let's, Let's James. start with that horse. Well, you see it from low down. You're very low on it. It has a very high pedestal. And uh, it, at this point, at least, although it wasn't quite at the time, it's kind of in the woods. It's in a very somewhat secluded, in my opinion, a little too secluded now, uh -huh. right. area when... Um, when Olmsted designed Riverside Drive, there were parts that, where the drive split off into what we call the access road and the main drive. Right. And this is one of those cases. So there's this kind of island, which is known as Joan of Arc Island. Exactly. Which is between a 91st Street and 95th Street. Exactly. Um, that separates the drive and the access road. I live on that access road, so that's how I right, right, right. interest in this country. Oh, you're our neighbor. I'm, an, and I'm it's, your neighbor. And, and the, the, yeah. the beautiful, tall buildings that front Riverside Drive and look out over the river are all there. The, they're, they're there. there. And, but, and what, what's interesting, though, is that it's placed facing away from that, and there was always a screen of trees behind it because they, they wanted to separate the sense of the city from the sculpture. And the sculpture that looks out, on, you would have seen the Hudson River uh -huh. at the time. At that time. Now yeah. you don't anymore. Right. So the placement is it, something that's... And it's that's high up, and it's a high up placement. Right. What's interesting is that I looked at a picture of our block, uh, which we share, uh, before our buildings were put in, and the height of the, of the stone there was about five stories taller than it is now. Everything's been regraded down. So when you see that rise, that's kind of the original, more the original height of that street. Oh, okay. And it's been cut down like three stories. Wow, wow. But that wow. makes it so much more impressive now. I right. was going to say that to me, that her long leg... And then the way she's standing in the saddle, straight up, and this—it's like this whole line. Yes, it's a great, a great. Sword. And I will say also, we Very joke dramatic. on the at uh, that neighborhood. We joke. Uh, I think there's some kind of weather effect by that hill that she's on, where the oh. wind increases the wind speed and the cold. And we say it all concentrates on the end of her sword and comes right down <laughs> on us in winter. In in, in the winter, yeah. Uh, so Anne, what, what do you? Uh, well, I see? think that that idea of the the body forming one straight line as she stands up in the stirrups. And that was what was the, the uh, editing between 1910 and 1914. Uh, the body went from being more a series of uh, zigzags to one straight line. And then what strikes me is that Joan is wearing full body armor, including the helmet. And that's extremely unusual in the history of Joan of Arc iconography because uh, people wanted to make it clear that Joan was a woman, so they would leave off the helmet, whereas Anna von Hyatt wanted the whole the look. Yet she's still a woman. I mean, when I look at I mean, maybe because I know it's Joan of Arc, it's but it, there's something man. feminine about it. Yes. Well, you're extremely sensitive to fine differences because oh, okay. we're in the 21st century. Yeah. So you really, you really notice that, that she is a woman. I think for 1915, it, it was maybe a more androgynous look at the time. Okay, all right. And Michelle, what, what, do, you, what do you see when you think about Joan of Arc? I see 
sculpture in sight, uh, S-I-T-E. Uh, in other words, one of the things that was really important at that point in time and one of the things that often determined whether a work was accepted by the city as part of its collection had to do with its location and placement. And those were really well thought out kinds of issues. So the, the physical connection of this monument to the surrounding landscape, not to mention the pedestal, which is really important. Uh, you know, we often see the, the, the photographs of just the monument, but the pedestal is, a, is an equal part of that monument and, and had its own sort of history. Uh, it contains stone from where she was tried, right? The prison cell. Well, that's the, the legend, at least, and okay. we're never going to be able to prove otherwise, yeah. so let's just believe. Okay, oh, I, yes. like, I like that. But I think story. for her to be standing on top of what stone that was her prison, mm-hmm. it, it's she's having a revelation, but it's also like a resurrection. So yeah. like, you might be seeing her during the battle, or you could be seeing her kind of rising out after death from the prison that contained her. Right, wow. and, the, and the armor is like a supernatural skin. It's, it's really like a whole uh, superhuman encasing of the body. Yeah, but yeah. I it, think that's what I mean when I see it. I see the feminine there because it, it is her. You it's, can, it's well-tailored armor, too. Yes, you know. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 It's just also important to, uh, for people not used to you know, paying attention to monuments to, to keep in mind that the, the monument kind of uh, energizes the space around it and so the and vice versa so the landscaping was all designed to work with the monument and uh in ways that it doesn't necessarily c- continue to do now i mean there's been there've been changes that are going on even now they're changing the landscape and the paving but all of that was very much a part of the full design of these monuments that they were uh, they they integrated the surrounding space. Yeah. The other thing I just want to mention that we are not privy to, I guess, is the the color of of the of the monument as it was originally. Uh, I don't know what the original patination was for that, and perhaps Phyllis Cohen uh, ha- has talked about that. But uh, in fact, I, I got a statement from Phyllis and also from Steve Toddy. Uh, and, and I'm going to be playing that in a few, in a few minutes here uh, about that patination. Right, talks about because that. That, was, that was always a, a big part of the design of the monument. And unfortunately, we over time, we lose track of what it was originally so that when it comes to conserving the monuments, uh, the challenge is to try to figure out how to recreate it or whether to recreate it. There are all sorts of other interesting issues. That's an interesting question because uh, Toddy was uh, explaining to me that uh, though you'd want to maybe try to get that back to that brown kind of quality that originally had that people are used to the copper green Mm. and that you want to kind of continue the copper green because that's what people are used to. And th- I mean, that's kind of what he said as a concern. Yeah. Or maybe I misinterpreted what he well, said. Well, if it's copper green, the problem is if it's copper green, it's really damaged. Yeah. And so you don't, you don't want that. Okay. Uh, you don't yeah. want to keep it that way, uh, for sure. Yeah, if you, I think if you look at pictures of the statue before 1987, when it received its, um, when it was restored uh, by the Grand Marnier Foundation, it looks a lot worse, and it's, it looks a lot better now than it did even in the early 80s, uh, where I think it was turning quite green, mm-hmm. and now it ha- still has a, a, a pretty good surface. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we don't really know what Joan looked like, right? But Hyatt said this. She said, quote, It was only her mental attitude, her religious fervor, that enabled her to endure so much physically, to march three or four days with almost no sleep, to withstand cold and rain, that is how I thought of her and tried to model her, end quote. Well, we really don't have too many accounts, and uh, we're back to the question of how Joan means something different for every age. Uh, she uh, has been represented across time as an, uh, uh, she's always the exception to the feminine beauty rule. So gorgeous, but in a completely unconventional way. Yeah. 
And it's, it's interesting that Anna von Hyatt emphasized the strength because she was herself an exceptionally strong woman. She was six feet tall and very, very strong. And I think in the best possible way, she was projecting her own strength onto Joan when she was imagining how to represent her. Interesting. I wanted to um, um, talk about you know, this uh, statue as a piece of art. It, is it art or is it um, a, a place up there to honor? I, I think we kind of talked about this, to honor a person. Is it a religious statue dedicated to a Christian god? Uh, is it a political statement? I mean, it could be seen in a lot of, a lot of different all ways. all of those yeah, things. Is it a depiction things. of an historical yeah. moment? Is That's it why just, it's so good. It's all those things. It is all those things. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And then, and then it changes in, from moment to moment, from time that's to time. That's the cool thing about public monuments. <laughs> uh, and that's why we that, shouldn't take them down. That's correct. That's a whole other uh, program. That's a whole other We're going to have a show but on We'll, we'll bring have you back uh, to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. In 1987, the Municipal Arts Society of New York had just started its Adopt a Monument program and took on the restoration of the Joan of Arc statue as its first project. And in fact, uh, Phyllis Cohen, who, is, who, who began the Adopt a Monument uh, program and still is head of it, is with us today here at uh, uh, Gephardt Spirit Culture Bar. I talked with Phyllis, and I began by asking her about the Municipal Art Society and her Adopt a Monument program. It was initiated by um, the Municipal Art Society in a joint partnership with the uh, Art Commission, now called the Public Design Commission, and the New York City Parks Department in 1987, when there was a period uh, with when government money for conservation of public art was very scarce, and neglect, acid rain, and vandalism were really um, destroying a lot of our outdoor sculpture. Uh, so the idea was to encourage private funders, corporations, foundations, individuals, to help save this legacy of great public um, great public art. When the program was announced, the New York Times picked it up and put it on the front page of their paper. The Grand Marnier Foundation, uh, in the name of France, immediately stepped in um, to save the Joan of Arc, which was pretty, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. They followed with two other monuments, which strongly identified with France, too. The rededication was really a celebration, exactly, of uh, womanhood and this French uh, historical figure. Gloria Steinem was there to uh, talk about that as well. We worked with the, the Art Commission has a uh, adjunct advisory group called the Conservation Advisory Group. Um, and we, that with the Municipal Art Society, with they call it CAG, um, reviewed different proposals from leading conservators uh, for various methods to restore this monument. And the uh, method that was chosen was uh, recommended by the conservator, Steve Taddy. It, it was a hot wax technique. So when you're finished, uh, there's this wonderful readability of all the statue's fine details that were lost um, when it was, um, you know, streaked and pitted. And now when you look at it, you can see the veins in the horse's face. You can see the fleur-de-lis on the harness. And it's just it's a magnificent, magnificent piece. It's Joan of Arc is an unparalleled equestrian statue of a woman by a renowned woman artist. And mm -hmm. it makes it quite we unique. We um, are responsible for the maintenance every year. And working with our partners at the Parks Department, in the beginning, Steve Taddy actually did the maintenance for it. Um, but now we've, we're using the Parks Department team conservation team and they have been um terrific and uh rewax we we pay for this but they have been rewaxing it and um maintain it with with the municipal art society the uh, complete conversation with phyllis cohen of the municipal art society will be available as a bar crawl radio number 58 extra so if you want to hear my whole conversation with her i also spoke with art conservator steve taddy who was vacationing in cabo mexico at the time uh, he's been in the business of restoring and maintaining statues for 35 years and received many awards. I began by asking him about the wax process he developed and used on the statue. We developed this process when I was working for the Smithsonian, specifically the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, and the, the large outdoor sculpture aspect of that museum. And we started doing this waxing, which became a hot waxing treatment back in the um, late 70s and early 80s. I then got a contract for the city of Baltimore, and over five years we did every outdoor monument, bronze monument in the city, 
utilizing this uh, technique and refining it uh, and perfecting it. We then uh, went to Philadelphia and did a similar program for them, for the Fairmont Park Art Association, and that was in the early 80s, and I moved to New York, left the Smithsonian, and um, was lucky to get a few jobs with the Municipal Art Society, with the Central Park Conservancy, to do some of the monuments in the city. Joan of Arc was one of the highlights uh, done to the Municipal Art Society. So at that time, we had really perfected the treatment, but also developed a treatment that could be maintained easily, frequently, and inexpensively. And that's what was really appealing to uh, the city of Baltimore, which did about 40 monuments. The city of Philly, the same thing. And New York was starting to sort of understand its uh, relevance. And I'm happy to say that both the Central Park Conservancy and the Landmark Commission uh, today have their own crews, which are uh, maintaining most of the outdoor bronzes. You can see all of them in Central Park uh, with a a variation, if not the exact the hot wax treatment that Joan of Arc got. No, it was a pleasure to work on that piece by Anna Hyatt Huntington. It's a wonderful piece in a wonderful setting, and uh, I now live at 81st and Broadway, so I'm in the neighborhood also. Okay, so that uh, was Steve uh, Toddy, um, and our conversation was longer, and he talked about the intimate nature of working with some great works of art, and you can listen to our entire conversation on Barco Radio number 58 Extra. So, I guess you all would agree that it's important to keep our sta uh, city statues in good shape. Absolutely. Uh, why? And <laughs> why? Uh, she, wait, her, you have to see. You can't see this, Bar readers. Her eyes are her, wide. <laughs> She's like, how can you ask such a question? They're part of the city's his, history. They're, they're part of New York's heritage. If you don't keep them up on a regular basis, as we are fortunate to have the Adopt a Monument uh, program doing with the Joan of Arc, uh, but which the Parks Department also does with a, most of its other monuments um, uh, with far less funding. Um, if you don't keep them up, they will disintegrate. And anyone who, anyone who lived in New York in the 1970s... Right, uh, we did and saw the graffiti-strewn, decaying uh, monuments everywhere, including works like the Main Memorial, which is now gilded and looks fantastic. Um, you, if you lived at that time here, you understand the importance of regular maintenance, which now uh, has to be built into any new kind of uh, monument project that that occurs and doesn't always happen, but right. they they try to do that. And it seems like they're they're now following the the, the city is following the pre prescripts of Steve Toddy by by every year um, fixing up the monuments. Well, now, it, it, it's why the statue looks so good today, and it and it doesn't need a major overhaul. It's because it was maintained in '87 and has been maintained since. And like so much else in New York, we take that for granted. These right. things are not maintained on their own. And I, I can talk to you about what happens with older sculptures that don't have that particular endowment. Yeah. As w when you try to build a new sculpture, you try to set aside money for upkeep. Right. Joan of Arc didn't have set aside funds. And it's one reason that Joan of Arc was not necessarily maintained, at least the surrounds of Joan of Arc were not maintained up to the standards as they should have been, although the statue was well maintained, the grounds were not well maintained. Right. Okay. And, it, and, and it's certainly being maintained now. Now James, in December 2015, you attended the 100 year celebration of the statue, uh, 1915 to 2015. You wrote about the experience in the New Criterion, and in your article um, you said that Joan of Arc is now, quote, a polarizing historical figure in France, adopted as a symbol of nationalist and shunned by the internationalist left. Yeah, that's right. What happens to the statue, or any statue, when it becomes politically, socially polarizing? Well, this is the concern, and in fact, um, I don't think you would have a French foundation funding a Joan of Arc restoration with the same willingness now as you did in the 1980s. I don't think Because so of this new association of Joan of Arc with French nationalism and the Popular Front, 
Um, it's not something we in, in the United States associate with Joan of Arc. She's a saint. I mean, that's what we see her. Um, uh, but I think in France, she's very polarizing right now and in a way that, let's say, a Confederate monument here might be polarizing. Right, right. Yeah, although there's, there's been a lot of waxing and waning of the nationalism over time, which allows us to, I think, have a little bit of perspective on that, especially Maybe wait here it in out. the U.S., yeah, you know, she was declared a, a, a patron symbol of France already by Napoleon way, way back in the beginning of the 19th century. And that somehow didn't stop her from being the symbol of the suffrage movement, too. So she's managed to be quite contradictory at, it, at, to different degrees for different people at different times. And... I think that teaches us that you, you got to hang tough. Fashions come and go, and although there are some areas, and I think we're all thinking about Confederate monuments, where you don't want to just sort of step back and let history rise and fall, but usually I think you do. So this brings us to this question we wanted to ask, or just to raise, um, that this is a work of a woman about a great woman, um, so now it seems that the, it, that Joan of Arc is being adopted by the feminist movement. Is that the case? She has always been always a symbol been. for okay. the feminist movement. Well, she is, you know, the most mili- militarily successful woman ever. So uh, she has yet to be surpassed. We're all waiting, I guess, for the day when Pentagon is run by a woman, but it's not yet. And how about the country's run by a woman? Yeah. I, I, you know, is that possible? A lot right, of that's a whole other question. You're going off if Joan of Arc <laughs> can, <laughs> can, yeah, can be anything English. is possible. Oh, a lot <laughs> of women have done possible. great things, that's for certain. So New York City public arts organizations and grassroots campaigns such as She Built NYC have been considering how well the city has honored the great women of our society. Has the city done enough in this respect? Uh, in terms of honoring women? women? Mm-hmm. They're doing plenty right now. Um, the the thing that to me is a little problematic is the way in which they're presenting the the failure to do so in the past as mm-hmm. reflecting negatively on all of our predecessors until now until we knew better, um, and so that to me uh, the perspective that's been taken I think is a little bit um, simplistic. Uh, to say the least. Yeah, I'd, but I'd much rather sort of be looking forward and putting much more emphasis on having women be a part of all future mixes and well, okay, maybe so a little bit less wh- unhappiness So about which the historical past. women would you like to see honored in our, in our city? Well, Anna von Hyatt. I, I, Interesting. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, who, who I would, think would it be a woman would do that statue or, or could a man do it? Look, I think we should all be extremely proud that that in 1915, uh, uh, one of the most successful sculptors in New York City was a woman. She was actually one of the highest earning women in all of America. A sculpture of a woman. And a sculpture of a woman sculptor. Oh, Sculpted. you want a sculpture of Anna von? Well, I thought that's, that's, what, I thought that's, oh, no, what, I, that's what the question. Joan of Arc oh, is more is honored to Anna what Hyatt she's already done. Memorial. I would say that's right. Yeah. Well, and, and you uh, put on a great exhibition about her, didn't you? Well, I liked it. I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> I, I drew on it for my article. It's great work. Thank so. you. That's great. Is it, is it available? I mean, can we see? Uh, sure, I'll send you a copy. That, that, and you can great. also you can access a lot of it online. Great. So, what is the city doing in, in terms of honoring women? In uh, right they now, they have. There are two separate sets of initiatives. The one is city sponsored, and the other one is sponsored by a private group. That is the Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and now Sojourner Truth great. Monument, uh, which uh, is very controversial right now. Uh, the other and larger initiative is coming out of the mayor's office, specifically uh, spearheaded by Sherlane McRae, the uh, Mayor de Blasio's wife. Uh, and that is called She Built New York. Right. And essentially they have, uh, they, they did a survey uh, of the general public uh, for who the public would like to see commemorated. They also had a 19-member task force that um, advised the city that 
what they, what they wanted to see was not individual hero monuments, but rather commemoration of women in a different way. So an idea of, a, of women suffragists, for example? Or you know, collaboration in some way, or something more collective in orientation, thematic right. in like, orientation. But they, the city ignored that, uh, the recommendations of its task force. Uh, and they also sort of ignored the recommendations of the public. Well, that's right. They didn't go with the top vote getter, right? Mother Cabrini that's right. was the top oh. vote. And they, uh, so they've selected five different monuments for each borough. Uh, the, the, ones that, the one that has been, where the artist has been chosen is Shirley Chisholm uh, the, as the subject. And that's going, uh, that's going uh, to be in Brooklyn, uh, just off of Prospect Park. This period when um, this Joan Doc uh, monument was put up in 1915 was a period of beautification of the city. Are we now in a, in a new age of beautification of New York City? I would say debeautification. Really? Uh, Why so? Uh, the city's not looking so good these days. And so, I mean, we're keeping up monuments, but um, I, I, ver- I have very low hopes for, uh, for this uh, monument, uh, this female monument uh, initiative. initiative. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's so... Con- it's so- difficult to get anything through with any kind of consensus in this very divided mm-hmm. age. I was at conversations around the, uh, the Stanton Memorial that's going to be put together, and I'm very glad that's going to happen. Uh, but even there, you say, well, if we just have Stanton, isn't that t- kind of saying that's just one person and weren't there many people in the suffrage movement? That's the, I think that's why Sojourner Truth was added, which I think actually was probably a I'm good not idea. convinced that that monument is going to happen. Oh, really? Oh, no. Well, uh, yeah. All right, l- ladies and gentlemen, I yeah. think this topic we can we need another program. <laughs> uh, we need to also talk talking. about you know the, the, the beloved statues and the hated statues right. and what statues need to go up and whether or not in our social um, kind of inability to get anything done can we get statues done? Well, and I was just going to say, if you look at what kind of monuments we get now, they tend to be very abstract, and yep. they kind of don't stand for anything. So what's yep. the biggest, largest monument we have now? It's the vessel down at Hudson Yards, which kind of doesn't stand for anything. Right. Yep. It doesn't represent right. anything. It's kind right. of a, uh, it's an empty void. Really. Right, right. Yeah, but when I think about most art history, uh, most of it was, is bad and pretty meaningless, and then there's the flash of genius every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, you can't hope for the flash of genius too, too often. But to have it, you've got to have a lot of you know, m- mediocre art. So I'm, I'm okay with do mediocrity. You think the, do you think the John Dark statue is a, a flash of genius? I think in its historical context, we can see it as a flash of genius better now than in yeah. 1915. Right. It is a rich life we live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Just down the block from our apartment in the Windermere Hotel is an inspired work of art, maybe a piece of genius, maybe not. You go check it out. A larger-than-life Joan of Arc standing on her strong horse with her sword held high in a well-fitted armor has graced our neighborhood for 10 decades. Upper West Siders, we urge you to take another look. We have been talking with art historians Michelle Bogart and Higone and culture writer James Panero. Thanks again for a wonderful conversation at one of our favorite neighborhood bars. We're here at, uh, well, you tell us where we're at. And we are at Bar Crawl Radio recording at Gephardt's Beer Culture Bar on West 72nd Street, across the street from the mortuary, mortuary down, down the, the block, block from Grace Papaya, Papaya and Trader, Trader Joe's. Joe's. And a mile from the Joan Dark statue on West 93rd Street in Riverside Park. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank At the you end of you. September, we will post a talk with uh, Jack Hirsch about his book, Death March Escape, the amazing story of how his father escaped Nazi death marches twice. And uh, listeners, if you like what you're hearing on Bar Crawl Radio, please contact us at barcrawlradio at gmail.com. Check out our website for additional materials on this uh, podcast. And this conversation will continue. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great conversation. So when's it going to be up on? Uh, on we've got, we, There's this, the guy to talk to. Uh, I'll let you know.